Although the C4 model has the number four in the name, I definitely don't recommend doing all four levels. What I do see as, as the major thing that people find attractive, that people find useful beyond the UML part, is that you actually made some decision. This episode was made possible thanks to Gotopia.tech. Simon, why don't you start by telling everyone who you actually are and what you do for a living? I'm an independent consultant, mostly specializing in software architecture. Now I get to do two things. I get to hopefully one day again fly around the world and run architecture workshops. And I also have another company called Structurizer, which is a, it's a set of tooling to help people create software architecture diagrams, essentially. Let's talk a bit about your, your efforts here. So I think there, is, there are two things that we should talk about. One is C4 and one is Structurizer. So maybe we can start with, with the C4 model and you can go into a bit more detail what that is and how it differs from UML. So the C4 model is essentially, it's a formalization of how I've always drawn software architecture diagrams. So in, in that kind of post UML phase, uh, where the organizations I was working for and with, they didn't want to use UML, and so they kind of threw us back to Visio. I had a specific way that I drew software architecture diagrams. So if I'm building a software system, I want a box in the middle of my diagram saying, this is the thing I'm building. I want to list out all the different types of users, the roles, the actors, the personas. And then I want to also show my key system dependencies because of course, as you well know, any way you've got a system dependency, there's some sort of interface and there's always some sort of risk associated with doing that. So that was always really my starting point for drawing out a software architecture. And then I wanted to kind of zoom into the system I was building and show deployable, runnable things. Like if, if we if we were building a web application talking to a database, I would literally draw, draw two boxes. Here's a web application and here's a database with an arrow between them. And again, this is really reflecting how I thought about the architecture from a developer's perspective, you know, as someone who ends up coding on, the, on those um, sorts of projects. So when I started teaching people how to do software architecture, I was quite focused on getting people to do the stuff we talked about before. So understanding architectural principles and guidelines and constraints and quality attributes. And I had a little case study in my workshop where people would uh, group together They'd go and do a small amount of upfront design for like an hour. And the output was one or more diagrams to describe their solution, essentially. And after doing that a bunch of times, I realized that I couldn't understand any of the diagrams and, and neither could anybody else in the workshop. So now I thought to myself, well, I, I know how I do this. Why don't I figure out how to teach that to other people? Because I, I just naively thought that everybody else did the same thing, but it turns out they don't. So that's where the C4 model essentially came from. It, it kind of was formalized in the latter half of like 2005 up to 2010, something like that. And the C4 model is a hierarchical set of diagrams to describe software architecture. Uh, C4 stands for context, containers, components, and code. So the context is a system context diagram. And that's basically what I described already. So it's a, a very high level diagram. It's a single box in the middle representing the system you are building. So maybe like an internet banking system. It's got the different types of users and actors and roles and personas around it with arrows, you know, using the system. And then a, a set of other boxes representing your system dependencies. And then you zoom into uh, the system boundary and you show what I'm calling containers. And I'll, I'll come back to that in a second because it's a little bit controversial. So I, I call these things containers, but basically they are deployable and runnable applications and data stores. So if you're building you know, uh, an Angular single page app that's sending JSON across the internet to a backend Ruby on Rails app, which is sticking stuff in a MySQL database, you draw those three boxes and the arrows between them. So again, it's, it's really reflecting the realities. And then if you want to, you can zoom into an individual application or data store and show components inside them. What do I mean by component? For me, it's just a grouping of stuff, uh, usually, you know, grouping of stuff, nice, well-defined interface. The components often or usually relate to how you are structuring your code from a high level. So if you, if you think about your code base as a set of components in a layered architecture, then your component diagram essentially represents boxes in layers. If you're doing ports and adapters or hexagonal architectures or, or package by a feature, then that's what your component diagram is essentially showing you. And then if you want to get really into the detail, you can zoom into an individual component to show the code inside it. 
So there's a few things to unpack here, I guess. Uh, number one, why did I choose the term container? So I think I got there before Docker. That doesn't make this right, but um, I, I tried to find a term that didn't have many associations and I obviously failed very badly. So I didn't want to use the word process because that's not what I was trying to show. I didn't want to use the word application because that's not what I wanted, what, what I wanted to show. At the time, I was big into uh, JTWE and we talked about servlet containers and EJB containers. And I, I just liked that container uh, kind of metaphors. Like here's a thing that runs and stuff goes inside it. So that's why I chose the term containers. And although the C4 model has the number four in the name, I definitely don't recommend doing all four levels. So for most uses and most teams, the top two levels are more than sufficient. And if you want to get more detailed, you can do. And then you get into the whole question of, well, should you start automating diagram generation and uh, and so on and so forth. But again, that's a bit out of scope for this discussion. So that's the, the C4 model in a nutshell. It's a hierarchical set of diagrams to describe software architecture at different levels of abstraction. And those different levels of abstraction allow you to tell different stories to different audiences. Mm -hmm. Okay. So my understanding, and, and I'll be interested to see what you think of that. My understanding is that uh, the major difference between that and what UML does, for example, is that UML is far more generic, right? It's that all of those things somehow, you can absolutely 100% use UML to do the exact same thing. It just doesn't recommend anything, right? It just gives you tons of options and yeah. you have to decide what to do with them. So you could use, you know, a, a component diagram and some, some sort of, uh, you know, package diagram and where the packages have sub packages and you go drill down all those, all the same, in the same way. Uh, finally ending up at classes or whatever it is. And I've seen you actually recommend combining the C4 model with other diagram types that are in UML, like a sequence diagram or mm. a collaboration diagram. So it could totally do that. What I do see as, as the major thing that people find attractive, that people find useful beyond the UML part is that you actually made some decisions, not all of them, but some decisions to say, well, this is the, this is the useful level, right? Just not any arbitrary number, it's four. Not any level, it's these, right? And yeah. This, 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 this may really be a stretch, but I want to run this analogy by you. It reminded me, weirdly enough, of something Eric Evans did in the DDD book. Before the DDD book, and that, that obviously was also one of those, oh, I'm doing that already while I'm reading this books for me. Um, he sort of proposed a number of, uh, of what in UML I would call stereotypes. Right, like you know, these are the kinds of things beyond just classes. Right, we have value objects, and we have entities, and we have services, and we have those things. And he sort of made it made a very explicit choice to include these whatever ten things. And that's not a it's not a real difference from just saying you have stereotypes, and you can you know you can you know you can actually customize the generic UML class diagram to or the, the class concept to mean something more specific. But still, it's immensely useful because it gives people more to hang on to. It just, you know, gives them a starting point as opposed to the super generic thing that some then somebody else would have to customize to actually become useful. Is that a fair analogy, or am I totally off? No, that's that's a, a completely fair analogy. I, I, I just going to ask you: Do you remember Peter Code's UML in uh, UML modeling in color? I think it was called. Yes, absolutely. it's the same thing. It's like you have these four exactly. different types of classes, and you 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 make them different colors. So what's really interesting is that the C4 model does not prescribe a notation. So there is no C4 model notation uh, and, and you can do whatever you want and you can apply whatever visual semantics to whatever notation you choose, you know, different shapes and colors and line stars and, and all that sort of thing. Something I always do in my workshops is I, I, I say to teams, you could use UML to do these diagrams. You're exactly right. It's you, you, you come up with a set of conventions and rules, so maybe you use um, uh, a use case diagram for a system context diagram, or maybe you have a component diagram and you apply appropriate stereotyping and that sort of thing. And I do offer this as a thing teams can do, and no one does it. Mm -hmm. And I still yeah. find that surprising. And I, I think you're right. When I introduce the C4 model, I often get a lot of skepticism because, and again, I. I kind of have to be careful how I phrase things initially because it tends to put a blocker up immediately. If I say, I'm going to teach you a diagramming technique and it's a framework and it has a bunch of rules and it'll make drawing diagrams really easy, everyone will instantly switch off. So that's not the approach I can go in with. 
if I if we have the discussion after the workshop and I say, so you've, you've, you've gone through this, you've created a bunch of useful diagrams, I can see you really like them. What feedback do you have? You know, what, what do you think is a selling point for this? A lot of the people actually say, well, you've given us a framework to work in. <laughs> and it's the same thing. It's like I've given them something to hang their ideas off. I've taken away a lot of the silly dis- uh, the, the silly decisions that really don't matter exactly. all too yes. much. Yes. Um, it's just a way to draw a bunch of pictures. We know what the pictures are and we can move on and we can get focused on something more important. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. I think that the key point here is there are tons of places where your creativity is way more useful than in the kind of lines or the way right. you draw a box, right? I mean, that's yeah. sure well, you can be super creative with your architecture <laughs> yeah. diagram notation, but no user is going to be happier because you had a, you know, because you decided to use color this way. Just, you know, getting it out of the <laughs> yeah. way is a very useful, useful thing there. Okay, very good. So what do you think about um, I'm hesitant to, to add, even ask that question, but what do you think about UML? Should we still be learning it and teaching it? Should it be part of, of a CS education? Um, I, I'm going to say yes, mm-hmm. actually. I, I, think it's, I think it's very useful. It, it, it's, so again, if you go back to the early uh, UML 1.0, 1.1, which was... 98-ish, maybe something around that sort of time scale. Yeah. Um, you can actually still find some videos uh, of uh, Grady Booch and the others teaching UML. And I think the best version of UML was actually those early versions because they were nice and lightweight. They were simple. There was a smaller number of diagrams, right? It was much, much simpler. And I've, I've, I've seen this complaint play a lot of times that over the years, the vendors have all got involved. They've all wanted their specific features for their specific tooling. They're all focusing on executable UML and, and defining complete architectures and you magically press a button and whoa, or, or, or your code pops out. And the whole UML thing has become sidetracked by vendors essentially. I think if you look at the core of UML, there's a lot of really good stuff in there. I don't like the fact that you have to read 750 pages to understand the entirety of it. The biggest thing I don't like about UML, aside from some of the tooling, which is awful, uh, different story, but the biggest thing I don't like about UML is that it doesn't help you. And this is exactly what you were saying earlier. If you if you fire up a UML tool and you say, right, I want to describe an architecture, it gives you no assistance. And, and furthermore, there are no good examples or case studies about if you have a modern microservices-based application, think about using these sorts of UML diagrams uh, in this sort of way to describe what it is you're actually building uh, and make it reflect reality and reflect the code and all that sort of stuff. So those are the major problems with UML, but having said all that, I still think it's a useful thing to teach. So the C4 model, it doesn't cover state diagrams, it doesn't cover activity diagrams, it doesn't cover business process diagrams or entity relationship diagrams. So even though C4 model diagrams, I, th- I still think should be supplemented where necessary with a whole bunch of other stuff from UML, from Archimate, from you know good old fashioned entity relationship diagrams. So I definitely think we should still be teaching it, but maybe with the emphasis that it's a tool in a toolbox. There's some useful stuff and there's some maybe less useful stuff. It's really, it's, it's, it's almost kind of a little annoying how much we agree, right? Maybe we have to talk about microservices <laughs> at some point in time yeah, to find yeah. something we disagree. It's the world's most boring but, discussion where people agree. <laughs> no, I totally agree with everything you said. I think it's useful. I think it's way too big and way too complicated. I think um, the, the mere fact that, at least with a lot of people, you can, you can draw a diagram in UML notation and a significant number of people will understand the semantics of what you just drew. I mean, that is a... That's a that's an extremely useful thing, right? I mean, in theory, this, that's it's it's kind of obvious, right? It's having a common language for those things, and you, there is no there are no points to be gained by you know having a different one than all the others because your class diagram is super special, or your entity relationship diagram, which is typically shown as a class diagram these days. So, yeah, okay. So, um, one, just just, assume- just to actually pick up on something you said there, what, one of my recommendations is even if people are using UML, they should still stick a diagram key, a legend, to explain notation. Because not everybody knows it. Oh, that's true. And that's, that's one of the biggest point. things. Once they see that complicated set of boxes and lines they've never seen before, like, that's too much for yeah. me. Yeah, very good point. Yes. 
I also think that even even within those diagram types, there are certain things that you that you might not want to use for certain audiences, right? Like using inheritance um, in a diagram intended to communicate with a business person is not going to help you in any way, right? Maybe it's a refinement if you want to do it at some later point in time, but it's not going to ease things at that at that stage. Neither are UML stereotypes or you know uh, types on attributes or whatever. Um, okay, okay. So um, one of the things that comes up. I think quite often is the question about how do you keep uh, documentation in general and diagrams specifically in sync with with the rest with the actual code because the code is obviously what matters and there's nobody nobody gains anything if you have a diagram that's out of sync with actual reality. What are your strategies there? You got two basic options, uh, and in many cases, option one is the most simplest, and unfortunately, at the moment, the most effective. So, option one is just update it. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. if you've got a definition of done for your task, so your work, I- work items, you add a line to the bottom, and it says, "Have you updated the diagrams and documentation?" Given this, hopefully, small change that you've made to the code base, and and that's often the easiest way. It's just a process thing, and it's done, uh, and we can forget about it. Option two is much more complicated, and that's really, well, let's auto-generate the diagrams and the documentation of the thing we're actually building. And that thing we're we're building could be the the code itself, so we could auto-generate diagrams of the code, or we could perhaps auto-generate diagrams of uh, build scripts, or infrastructure provisioning scripts, or maybe the live infrastructure, or maybe things like distributed logging and tracing. So you've got a bunch of different inputs you can use to potentially automate and auto-generate diagrams. However, and, and this is where things start to get a little bit complicated, and I'm sure you've seen this yourself, if you open up an IDE with like a million lines of code and you ask it to draw you a picture, what do you get? Like oh, just an mess. utter mess. It's crossing right. lines and sure. Yeah, and it, it's not because your code's a mess, hopefully, it's, it's because it's trying to show you too much. It's trying to show you exactly what the code is look like. It's, it's reflecting that low level of detail. And that's not useful to us as humans. We need to kind of chunk it up and zoom out, which is where the C4 model comes into play again. And you often get the same thing if you start auto-generating um, for build scripts and, and running infrastructure as well, because if you've got like 100 versions of a microservice running, do you want to show 100 things or do you want to show one thing with some, some variability somewhere else? So the whole auto-generation thing is a bit complicated and it's a bit tricky at the moment. And, and also, a typical code base doesn't tell you the whole picture. So if, if you think about the system context diagram I kind of briefly outlined earlier, you've got a, a box in the middle representing system, different users, different system dependencies. It's really hard to generate that high-level diagram just from using the code as an input, as a source. So that's some of the, the kind of real world challenges we face here. There's not enough metadata in most code bases to, to generate high level pictures. And if you generate the low level pictures from code bases, you often get too much. And there's there's often no easy way to get that happy medium. So that's why option one is often the easiest, unfortunately. Yeah, I'm, I'm old enough as, as you are probably to remember uh, things like together, that the started out together, C++ yeah. together job or whatever, the together, a case tool that simply, re- you can't really say reverse engineer, it simply showed you your code as a UML. It was model. a, it was a round trip, use, wasn't it? Yes, a complete round trip engineering amount, mm. where you could actually edit the code within the diagram. You could switch, you could seamlessly switch between the IDE because essentially the case tool was your IDE. And I never found that an appealing a thing because it didn't give me the abstraction that I want from a model. I want the model to focus on one aspect, like for example, the structure that you mentioned. And not on all of the details. If I wanted to focus on all of the details, I would look at the code and not at a high-level <laughs> diagram. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, but yeah, there was another, too. I think, extremely important point that you made that I also want to highlight, uh, which is the one that um, the code, while being super important, is not everything, it's especially not in modern architectures, right? Maybe, yeah. I, I, I highly doubt it even then, but maybe back then, like 20, 30 years ago, when you wrote a program that essentially was a standalone thing that you ran on the command line and then produced whatever a file took a file as an input produced another file then maybe the whole truth was within the code of that particular program but these days everything is a complicated collection of independent 
deployable units or containers in your terminology, if I remember correctly. So all of those things communicate and the communication paths are sometimes only discoverable at runtime. They're not even in any configuration file or in any anything that resembles code, right? It's really something that yeah. you could only discover if you could look into the minds of the architects or actually, or the coders, or developers, or actually observe uh, or surveil the system at, while, it, while it runs. So yeah. that is definitely a very complicated thing. Have you, by the way, found a solution to, I think, a related problem? Even if you can figure out, like, uh, say, dependencies between artifacts of some kind, uh, between deployables, for example, once you visualize them using something like GraphViz or any sort of thing, um, I think while the while the quality has gotten better in recent years, it's never as perfect as something that you would have drawn yourself, right? If you can actually realign the boxes and you move this line a little bit there and this box a bit over here, then it actually looks better. But the problem, of course, is it's lost once you regenerate the whole thing, right? So you'll have to do that over and over again. Has anybody yet come up with a solution that allows you to, you know, apply the visual changes like a diff to the auto-generated graphic? Am I making any sense? Do you have any idea what I mean? Uh, yeah, kind of. So I'm, I, I must admit, I'm not a huge fan of the auto layout algorithms like you get in graphics. I I always find they put things in the wrong place. And, and when I'm telling a story, if, if I'm doing a presentation or something, I want to point at things or I want to group things visually because they kind of belong together. They might be the mm -hmm. same type, but from a, from a kind of uh, nodes and edges graph perspective, you know, you've got your typical right. all dependencies flow downwards with things like graphics and plant UML and, and they give you this weird layout. Something I did a while ago was, was I started creating some, some tooling called Structurizer and I wanted to build something that would let people draw diagrams easily and again, would take some uh, control away from them. Does that make sense? No. To, to, to take some freedom away from them in terms mm -hmm. of notation, so a, kind of a fixed notation. But I still wanted the ability to move boxes around myself. So uh, as a part of the Structurizer tooling, you can, you can upload a new definition of your model and the views in the model, and the Structurizer tooling will attempt, and it's not perfect by any means, but it, it will attempt to retain the existing layout. So I'm, I'm trying to do a blended approach there. Mm -hmm. That's basically what I was what I was asking for. So that sounds that sounds very interesting. So can you can you tell us a little bit more about Structurizer? Just maybe brief intro. So when I was doing my workshops on the C4 model. Uh, up until about five years ago, people would always ask me, what tooling do you recommend? And my answer was always just use Visio. Mm -hmm. And you have no idea how irritating and frustrating that is. So I, I figured, well, I, I should try and do something. If I'm promoting this way of, of drawing diagrams, I should try and build some tooling myself. And so I sat down and I, I started to put together, and this sounds horrible, and it was, I started to put together a, a HTML web-based modeling tool specifically targeted around the C4 model, and it was horrible. It was it was the worst UX you've ever experienced in your life. But the interesting thing about that was the, the stuff behind it, the, the actual framework and code I'd written, was a really nice way to succinctly define a model and different views onto that model. And that was essentially a set of Java classes. So there were a set of Java classes sitting behind this web application representing people and software systems and containers and components. And I figured out, well, let's ditch the UI. Let's only have the UI for drawing the diagrams and let's allow people to describe their architecture using code. So you basically create a bunch of objects in memory, wire them together with a, a nice little API. And that would create you essentially a, a directed graph. And once you have that directed graph, you can export it to different formats and visualize it in different ways. And that's actually where the Structurizer tooling came from. So that was about five years ago. And that, there's a whole bunch of different um, different ways you can use the tooling and there's there's a community of different tools that have kind of popped up around it so so my, my original version of tooling was you write some java code you get some diagrams now there are libraries for all sorts of different languages that people have written and they've open sourced when we were locked down last april i put together so if you're familiar with something like plant uml where you you write text and get diagrams I, I created something I call the Structurizer DSL, uh, Domain Specific Language, and it allows you to define a model and a bunch of views as a single DSL file. Also, whilst we were uh, in lockdown and I wasn't doing very much traveling, 
I came up with a bunch of open source tooling and uh, there's something called the Structurizer CLI. So what you can do is you can define uh, a C4 model, so to describe your architecture, and you can describe a set of views in that single DSL file. And then using the CLI, you can export it to my Structurizer tooling, which is available at Structurizer.com, or you can export the views in that DSL file to PlantUML or to Mermaid or to Web Sequence Diagram. So it's what it's become now is a way to describe an architecture using those sets of uh, uh, the, the, the hierarchical diagrams and the hierarchical viewpoints and stuff, but with independence in the way you actually visualize that model. So mm -hmm. that's kind of what it is today. Very cool. Okay, so uh, before we, we wrap up, one last question I have is, um, obviously we're going to point people to your books and to Structurizer, to your website, which is lots of resources. Are there any other resources that you think are useful for developers getting into architectural work? There's a bunch of really good books come out recently. Uh, so Neil Ford and Mark Richards have a book. Um, and the name completely escapes. I think me. it's fundamentals of software architecture. Yes, fundamentals of software architecture. Correct. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I can I can visualize it with with mm -hmm. the uh, picture on the front. So yeah, that's that's a very good book for people looking to get into architecture. Uh, Greg Hope has got a book out called The Software Architect Elevator, mm -hmm. and that's a really interesting book because it it talks about the software architecture role, not just from a technical perspective, but in terms of what that role means to the entire organization. Mm -hmm. And it focuses a bit more on uh, soft skills and presentation skills and and influence and, and that sort of thing. So that's another really good resource I'd, I'd point people to. Plus you've got uh, Michael Keeling's Design It, you've got George Fairbanks's um, Just Enough Software Architecture, Owen Woods, Nick Rosansky Brooks, Software Systems Architecture. There's lots of really good stuff out there mm -hmm. kind of focused now at, at software developers. Uh, well, I'll definitely put them all in the show notes and then uh, our <laughs> listeners can, can definitely check them out. Okay, so uh, thank you very much for all your time, Simon. It was an awesome conversation. I really, thank really you. enjoyed it. Thanks for being with me. Thanks for being with us. And uh, enjoy the rest of your day. You too. Thank you. Subscribe to the GoTo YouTube channel now and join the experts in person or online at any upcoming GoTo conference using the promo code BOOKCLUB. Visit gotopia.tech to learn more.